and welcome to The Rob Burgess Show. I'm, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this our 134th episode, our guest is Brian Vandemark. Brian Vandemark grew up and attended college in Texas, went to graduate school in California, and now lives in Maryland. He teaches history at the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, where he has been a member of its history department since 1990. The author of several books on American history, he co-authored Robert McNamara's number one best-selling Vietnam memoir, In Retrospect, which became the basis of Errol Morris's Academy Award-winning documentary film, The Fog of War. His most recent book is Road to Disaster, A New History of America's Descent into Vietnam, which was published by HarperCollins in 2018. And now, on to the show. Hello? Hi, it's Rob. Hey, Rob. How are you? Good. How are you? Okay. Great. Hey, thanks so much for taking time out of your uh, weekend here to, to talk to me. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. I'm happy to. Yeah, definitely. Well, for people who don't already know who you are, would you mind go ahead and introduce yourself here? I'm Brian Vandemark. I teach uh, history at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. Uh, I've been doing that for nearly 30 years now. Um, and I've written a book on uh, decision-making uh, concerning Vietnam during the Kennedy and Johnson administration. It's published by HarperCollins uh, in the fall. Yeah, and I'm I'm reading it now, and it's it's very interesting. It's very engrossing. Uh, it talks about a lot of things that, of course, are we already know a lot about. But but you have kind of a unique take on a certain, or you have a, a fresh theories or ideas about why we should think about they made these certain types of decisions. Um, I actually before I started reading this, I didn't know I knew your work a little bit already because uh, in college I actually saw the uh, Fog of War um, that introduced me, of course, to uh, somebody that you obviously have written about uh, Robert McNamara. Um, could you talk a little bit about him, first of all, just for people that aren't aware of, the, of this guy? Yes. Uh, 24 years ago now, uh, I co-wrote his memoir on the Vietnam War, uh, named In Retrospect, and uh, I worked with him for several years in preparing that book. It was the first time that he really addressed that uh, paint subject publicly. Um, he later returned to it. Um, in other venues, including the very famous Academy Award winning documentary that you saw, The Public War. Yeah, and he just had a fascinating career, um, being the head of what General Motors, right? And then um, Ford. Sorry, Ford. Uh, yes, uh, and then just you know walking right into this, uh, you know, the Vietnam thing. I mean, just wow, just um, amazing. Like, wh- I guess we jump, might be jumping all ahead a little bit here, but how much blame or credit does he deserve, or does really anyone deserve in that uh, position about you know the Vietnam War? Because it seems like almost the gears are spinning larger than some. Of these people individually, so I think Secretary of Defense uh, for seven years. He's the longest continually serving Secretary of Defense in America. Mm-hmm. Um, he bears a great deal of responsibility mm-hmm. for the Vietnam decisions made by both President Kennedy and Johnson. Um, I would say that he shared that responsibility with that entire cohort of high officials uh, in multiple administrations across decades, going all the way back to President Truman in 1945. Uh, through uh, President Nixon in 1973. I've, you know, I've asked other historians this, and, and obviously it's always, a, I'm sure, a challenge when you're writing about history, but how do you find a new way to write about something that's been so completely written backwards and forwards? But uh, talk about a little bit your writing technique here, because you do employ a little bit of uh, psychological theory or um, kind of maybe see why people made certain decisions when they did. Uh, could you talk about that? I can. Uh, I had written about Vietnam myself uh, in the early 1990s. My case dissertation had published the book titled Into the Quagmire. Shortly after that, I uh, also worked with Robert McNamara, and then I moved away from Second to Vietnam uh, for a very long time because I felt that uh, what I had helped him say uh, was more important and more enduring than anything I could write. And I wanted one day to return to the subject, but uh, I could not and would not do that as long as he was alive, because I, I said critical things that would hurt him, and uh, I had no intention of actually hurting other people. And during that entire period of more than 20 years, I wrestled with the fundamental question, which is I knew he and others he served with, and I thought the government during the 1960s, were fundamentally decent, honorable, patriotic, intelligent people, and yet they made incredibly stupid decisions that uh, had immense consequences in terms of human suffering for both Americans and, and the Chinese. And I didn't, 
I wasn't able in my own mind to uh, reconcile that uh, contradiction until I began exploring some of the insights of uh, social scientific research, particularly that of cognitive psychology and behavioral economics, in which much work has been done in terms of uh, heuristics, which are simplifying rules of thumb that all of us use uh, in order to make sense of the world, process information, and to make judgments and decisions, and how flawed that oftentimes can be. And I think that understanding that uh, cognitive limitation, which afflicts very intelligent people, uh, as well as ordinary mortals like you and me, uh, drives on a fundamental point, which is because cognitive constraints undermine objective assessments. And the heart of the problem is that Vietnam is a whopper, uh, more binding cognitive constraints become. And I think that that helps explain and allows one to understand more deeply uh, the paradox of uh, very decent, very intelligent, very patriotic people making very poor decisions. And it's they are vulnerable to making those kinds of poor decisions that you and I certainly are. And the midshipmen I teach at the Naval Academy in Annapolis are too. And I want to drive that point home to them because one day some of them are going to be senior leaders carrying a lot of responsibility and making hard choices about complex issues. And you really start the discussion here uh, you're talking about the Bay of Pigs and, you know, that was kind of a precursor to some more bad decisions that were laid uh, later down the line, of course, to come. But um, talk a little bit about that because I always thought that was a fascinating uh, scenario that kind of, I think, set into motion a lot of things, of course, later that, you know, then were very consequential then, like the Cuban Missile Crisis. So... I, I, unlike many historians who write about this period of the Vietnam War, uh, introduced the book by uh, going over decision making related to the Bay of and the Cuban Missile Crisis, which were the early decision making uh, turning points in Kennedy's administration. And the fundamental point I wanted to drive home there was that a lot of the uh, limitations in terms of how they approached decision making um, were set in place during those early crises. In addition to that, a very significant dynamic emerged uh, during the Bay of Pig and the Missile Crisis, which was the very problematic nature of the relationship between senior military officers um, and the President McNamara. And I think that that helps explain why, once the Vietnam decision-making heated up, particularly after the, the uh, coup against the end of 1963, right around the time of Kennedy's own assassination, there was an environment or a climate in which... Essentially, the president and McNamara were very skeptical about the judgment of senior military officers who had been extraordinarily hawkish in their advice uh, during the missile crisis. I think that that inhibited a uh, free exchange, a very candid exchange of concerns and uh, anxieties on the part of both the civilian leadership and the military leadership. Mm-hmm. And that had a catastrophically bad effect on the quality of decision making during the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. Um, and you, you realize when you read, like, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis part, I, I, I was born in 1983, and I, I just I read that, and I was like, oh, well, I guess I almost wasn't born by about 20 years, I guess. So <laughs> everything, you know, everything was on the table. You know, um, it's just a, you know. Privately, after the fact, he said, Brian, um, humanity survived uh, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis essentially because of pure dumb luck. Mm. The process of misperception um, and misjudgment based on misperception, both in Washington and Moscow and Havana, uh, brought us to the cusp of an utter catastrophe. Oh, yeah. When you talk about uh, a little bit about this in the book, too, uh, some people still thought of nuclear weapons as, like, just another tool in the tool belt of war. You know, this is just something we can pull out. And, you know, at this point, both countries have a gun to each other's head. And if, if it jumps off, it's really, really going to, it's over. Like, it's a Dr. Strangelove times, you know. <laughs> but um, <laughs> the important difference between now and then mm-hmm. is that back then, which is more than half a century ago, uh, a large significant number of the senior military officers in the United States Armed Services simply viewed nuclear weapons as bigger bombs. Mm. In other words, as usable weapons. Mm. Now, McNamara, Kennedy, and Johnson, civilian authorities who had responsibility for making decisions concerning nuclear war and peace, viewed them very differently as weapons that existed simply to deter their use by others because the destructive capacity of them were insanely enormous and would lead to mutual destruction um, and annihilation, which obviates the whole purpose of the war, which is to uh, achieve a political objective. 
And I think the military, uh, as I mentioned before during the Cuban Missile Crisis, they pressed Kennedy hard uh, to use military force against the Soviets during the Missile Crisis. Mm-hmm. If he had listened to their advice, you wouldn't have been born and I would have been uh, dead within two years of my own birth. Yeah, right. <laughs> Over time, uh, the military and the senior leadership uh, in successive years uh, have matured and become much more thoughtful mm-hmm. um, and understanding about the limitations um, and, frankly, insanity of uh, using nuclear weapons. Uh, as I explained to the students at the Naval Academy, in my opinion, the only moral strategic justification for the existence of nuclear weapons in the American arsenal is to deter their use by others. Yeah. And I think the vast majority of senior military officers in the United States today agree with that. Mm-hmm. Oh, most definitely. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the specific uh, psychological theories that, that you bring up? You bring up some studies uh, while you're talking about these and, and any that are pertaining to what kind of what we're talking about, like the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I think confirmation bias is always one that is, is huge. Confirmation bias is a, a affliction of all of us. Mm-hmm. All human beings, uh, unconsciously, subconsciously, tend to filter the information that they process and uh, make decisions on through the lens of their own assumptions, prejudices, and biases. And uh, highly intelligent people are no less immune to that uh, vulnerability than you and I are. And they're also oftentimes operating in a high-stakes environment where they have to make decisions pretty quickly with incomplete information against a rapidly existing clock. And that does not encourage the self-reflection and self-awareness uh, that is necessary to correct with that kind of confirmation bias. Uh, another insight of social science, which I think is very significant later in the story, is what's known as the sunk cost fallacy. Mm. And I think that helps people more deeply understand why Johnson and the hidden advisors continued to deepen the American military commitment in Vietnam when it became manifestly clear that it wasn't working. Mm-hmm. And I think that what readers need to understand is that social scientific research through experiment after experiment has demonstrated that people tend to be more willing to take risks in the context of losses than gains. That they're conservative when it comes to gains, but they're risk-taking when it comes to losses. Hmm. And Johnson was certainly uh, in that boat in the sense that he would continue to double down uh, against um, blatant evidence that it wasn't working. And I think part of that is that psychological dynamic of the sunk cost fallacy. Mm-hmm. And in human terms, he had made decisions that had led to the loss of American lives. And I think for any human being, um, the impulse, almost the psychological imperative, is to continue to pour in more and more in order to validate the sacrifices that have already been made. Right. And I think it's, it's much easier for people who haven't bared responsibility for those kinds of decisions to criticize them after the fact when all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, would be just as vulnerable to that imperative. In other words, if you and I made decisions that led to the lives of other people, uh, we'd be deeply reluctant to say we made a mistake and to walk away. Mm. We'd probably be tempted to double down in order to validate the previous sacrifice. But what that produced over time was dynamic where by early 1968, the United States had more than half a million men chasing the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese around uh, the highlands and jungles of Vietnam, and they did not want to be found. And if you can't bring your enemy to battle, you're never going to win a war of attrition against them because they control their casualties. Mm. And I think by late 67, um, partly because McNamara had been brutally frank with Johnson, Johnson realized that the uh, war could not be won except for risk and cost, and that he needed to shift his position fundamentally from pouring in more uh, more and more men to recognizing that that wasn't going to work and that it was important to begin the process of turning the war over to South Vietnamese and disengaging. Mm-hmm. But as we've learned in Iraq and Afghanistan and as McNamara's successors, Secretary Defense Clark Clifford once told me, getting into a war is a thousand times easier than getting out of one. Mm. Yeah. And uh, what, we're just about to negotiate peace with the Taliban and it's 19 years now. It's just people are people could have been born before this start like after this started and be serving in it now it's that's mind blowing to me yeah, um, i mean it's extraordinary and i think presence um, going back some time i know it this is true of Obama as well as trump uh, they both want out of afghanistan but they just found it hellishly difficult to figure out a way to do that mm-hmm. which in their judgment would protect 
American interests and not risk the American homeland to another attack like 9-11. Mm-hmm. But those kinds of, the intractability of disengaging from conflict like that um, is enormous, but it's usually not perceived or even considered at the front end of that kind of endeavor. Mm-hmm. And I want people, I want decision makers, I want uh, soldiers and sailors and those who have to go in harm's way in our name to recognize that risk up front rather than um, have to struggle with it uh, once that train is left the station. Right. And then you have things like coin where you're trying to like, you know, maintain an entire civilization on the back of the military. And it's, it's just a lot to ask of, of people that are serving to like, you know, uphold a civilization while they're like at, in a war, you know, it's in it. Yeah. And it changed over time. Mm. You know, war was the era in which, uh, but soldiers in the jungles uh, serving the United States were draftees. Mm. Um, the, the popularity of the war terminated the draft. Yes. Never come back short of a national emergency. But what that has done is it's created a volunteer military, which is very professional and utterly isolated from the vast majority of the American public. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think less than 2% of Americans have ever worn the uniform. And I think that that creates uh, a special burden on people who get sent back again and again and again to serve in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And they're asked to, be, uh, to accomplish something which, frankly, um, may be impossible, which is to build, uh, through American efforts, an indigenous political entity in countries like Iraq and Afghanistan that has to be uh, originated and uh, maintained by the Iraqis and Afghanis themselves. And uh, that's a bitter lesson that we learned in Vietnam. We gave the South Vietnamese an extraordinary amount of financial, military, economic, and political assistance over decades, and they were never able uh, to make good use of it. And when we left, it was in South Vietnamese against the North Vietnamese, they didn't stand a chance. Hmm. And I think that's a very telling commentary on the profound limitations of the ability of the American military to uh, create a sustainable government in a foreign country. Mm-hmm. Well, and then, of course, you just have to stop a vacuum of power happening. So really, that's all you're just you're just plugging that up so that no one else takes over because there's really no. Yeah, right. Exactly. Precisely. The, the, the concession that the Taliban has apparently made in the last several days, hmm. where they have in these talks with uh, American representatives indicated that if the United States disengages militarily from Afghanistan, they will commit to prevent allowing Afghanistan to be used as a haven by terrorist organizations to attack us again in the future. And uh, I suspect that is uh, the primary uh, item of uh, concern on the board, not the Trump, um, only the Trump administration, but probably for the Obama administration as well. And if the Taliban are serious about that and they can keep their word, um, I think that the, the uh, primary reason that we need to be there militarily uh, has been addressed. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, going back to Vietnam, though, um, this was the era of the domino theory, and this is the era of we can't give an inch because, you know, we'll just talk about a little bit for the domino theory, what people were, the, the thinking behind this was, because it was, it was very prevalent during the time. Even Kennedy was very on this. So. As the cliche is true, uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty. <laughs> look back now in the era, and it's so hard to understand why we've become so deeply entangled in such a distant place where American national interests seem so uh, limited. And I think what people are find very difficult to understand is the political climate that existed in this country during the Cold War, from the end of World War II through uh, the Vietnam War. And that was one of virulent anti-communism, mm-hmm. a rather simplistic perception of communism throughout the world, that it was fundamentally uh, monolithic, and to use a metaphor, that every communist movement throughout the world was taking orders from some radio shack in the Kremlin, <laughs> and that was simply not the case. But the assumption was made, it became dogma, that people uh, stopped questioning. And I think uh, related to that is political um, ramifications of that domestically. Uh, but Truman, when mainland China fell to the communists in 1949, was savaged. Uh, by the Republican Party for losing China, as if we ever had it to, to lose. It was the Chinese nationalists who lost, China, not the United States, but the Democratic political figures uh, after Truman, including uh, ambitious young politicians like John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson, learned a lesson from that, which is 
do not lose another country to communism because the domestic political consequences for you and your party would be devastating. Mm-hmm. And I think that both of them wrestled with that dilemma because what they started was this imperative not to lose it, but also not to get sucked into it militarily. And I think Kennedy was able to finesse that more or less, but his willingness to accept the coup, uh, removing the leader's South Vietnam in November of 1963, uh, just weeks before his own death, set in motion uh, political chaos that Johnson had to cope with. And then that ultimately led to him having to um, deal with what I call the eight ball exploding, which was the country was going to go down if the United States did not intervene militarily. And Johnson made the fundamental judgment that uh, it was riskier to leave South Vietnam than it was to get deeply involved militarily. And mm-hmm. I think that, again, in hindsight, that was a very poor judgment. Yeah, um, and you know, going going forward, of course, uh, Nixon promises to end the war. That's what he's like, supposedly the anti-war candidate, right? That's his big candidate uh, thing. Yeah. He, or he's got he's got a plan to end the war, but really behind the scenes, he's he's messing up the negotiations, right? We found out in the last few years, right? Yes, he was he was a prominent uh, figure in the Republican Party uh, even after his very close loss to Kennedy in 1960 and his uh, failure to win the California governorship in '62. Particularly after Goldwater was trounced by Johnson in 64, Nixon emerges as one of the leading figures of the Republican Party, and he resumed his line of attack against the Democrats that he had adopted when he was in the House in the late 40s and 50s, when he called the Democratic Party, quote, the party of treason, unquote. And I think that made uh, Johnson extraordinarily sensitive to Nixon's criticism. And when Johnson made the decision to escalate American military involvement, he was echoing the line that Nixon himself had been trumpeting. Now, by 68, the war is unpopular with the American people. Uh, and Nixon, being a savvy politician, understood that. And he started making noises to the effect that he had a plan, quote unquote, for ending the war. Of course, he didn't have a plan, but uh, that was a very appealing uh, bit of rhetoric for the voters. And in addition to that, uh, as I lay out towards the end of the book, um, he worked behind the scenes uh, to sabotage. Uh, the ability of the United States to begin diplomatic talks in Paris with North Vietnamese because our South Vietnamese ally was being encouraged by Nixon and his cohorts to stall and not participate in talks, even though he publicly uh, professed uh, the need for such talks and told Johnson privately that he had nothing to do with blocking them. Mm. Yeah, it's just, it's it's amazing. But um, going back to some of these uh, theories that you talk about for why people are, are doing things, um, have, you, have you heard of the, you've of course heard, but the Goldwater rule, where you're not supposed to, if you're a mental health professional, diagnose people from afar. Now, I know you're not diagnosing people in this book. You're not saying this person has this ailment, but you are kind of ascribing, you know, uh, this is why they did this, or at least offering a theory as to why. Um, you know, I, I think, honestly, if there's enough evidence, I think it's okay to say like what you think what the the thinking behind it is like it's like if you you have thousands and thousands of hours of recorded conversation from somebody it's it's okay to make some you know adjustments but uh what do you think about that rule and as it applies to some of the things that you say in your book here well i take your point Mm -hmm. i'm much more modest in my claims both to you now and in the book and as i've uh, done in the book i have rooted whatever insights i offer to readers in an extensive amount of social scientific research, I recreate for readers experiments that have demonstrated these cognitive limitations on the part of human beings when it comes to processing information. Because that is an empirical manifestation, not a theoretical conjecture, mm-hmm. about the foibles that you and I and all human beings suffer from when it comes to processing information and making decisions. And I think that that's important for people to grasp because it helps them better understand the paradox, which is that the Vietnam tragedy is not the story of evil men uh, sending the United States into the quagmire. It's the story of well-intentioned men doing that. And people find it very difficult to accept that because when things go badly wrong, the human tendency is to scapegoat. I understand that completely. Mm-hmm. But I think if you do if you do accept that reality, um, it makes the story of why we failed so much more deeply understandable. And it's uh, it's a useful reminder to all of us that uh, everyone is vulnerable to those cognitive limitations. Um, we're all 
uh, mortal in that respect. And uh, I think that's a healthy thing to remember um, that, uh, as I think the uh, New Testament comment was, he was about sin, let him cast the first stone. Mm -hmm. Um, If we uh, also um, are susceptible to those cognitive limitations, and I think that would give us pause in terms of um, emotionally hammering people who made grievous mistakes, but not because of bad intentions, get good ones. I'm I'm really bad at grocery shopping sometimes because I just I'm overwhelmed by like the choices I have, and I'm like I just like if I had two choices, I would just be like, okay, give me the one on the left. But since there's like a million choices, and it's like it's almost sometimes the thing of you have so much information that your brain just shuts down or something like. And I think these people sometimes they have they have all the angles, but they can't see like the forest for the trees, or you know they can't step back and and see it for what it is. And I think that's how it happens so often, uh, in, especially in what you're writing. About. And again, when you're talking about the best and brightest, and David Halberstam called them. Oh yeah. They, they, they had limitations. Um, they did not seek out information that would have helped them make better decisions. Hmm. They, but again, they, their knowledge and understanding of Southeast Asian history and culture was appalling. And yet, all Americans understand with very, very few exceptions, was equally appalling. And those two people, the experts who had knowledge of that region of the world, tended to be very, very low in the bureaucratic food chain, uh, usually in the field. And their information um, would not be sent directly to the very top of the decision-making hierarchy. It would be filtered up. And I think that, too, proved to be uh, a profound limitation. And the other point that is an important one, which is they're making decisions with immense mistakes on very complex issues. Um, rapidly uh, with incomplete information. And that is a recipe for poor judgment. And I think what is doubly tragic about that is that the, the result can be um, a immense amount of human suffering. And uh, God knows that that's true in Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. And I think people should also understand that the decision makers who are responsible for those decisions uh, were not tone deaf uh, to the moral and ethical implications of uh, their decisions and their responsibility for them. Uh, Macler himself uh, suffered uh, in his own way uh, for the rest of his life. And I think that's a, a powerful reminder uh, to all of us that uh, everyone who seeks to become a high political figure assumes that it's all a lot of fun and that flying around the world in force one is a big power trip. But in reality, decision making at that level of government uh, is usually one in which you're having to make judgment calls of 5149 nature. Uh, with include information in a big hurry, and you never know if the judgments you make are right, and yet the consequences are very real uh, for others, and you have to live with those consequences for the rest of your own life. Mm-hmm. Um, I th- one thing I thought was really interesting uh, in the book was kind of the tension between the civilian and the military. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, this Bay of Pigs has given us a crisis uh, uh, that's an environment in which the Vietnam decision making will be made shortly thereafter. And it's a reason why the highest levels of military and civilian leadership never leveled with each other because they fundamentally didn't trust each other. And that is uh, one lousy atmosphere in which to make good decisions because in order to make good decisions on war and peace, you need to understand what, what the vulnerabilities are. Uh, Civilian leaders need to understand what the military thinks the vulnerabilities are, and military leaders need to understand what the political vulnerabilities are for those who ultimately make the decision according to the Constitution. And that was absent during the decision making. And I don't think that you can understand that if you don't understand the story of the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, so. I mean, what should have happened then if, if not this? Like, we, obviously, terrible mistakes were made again and again for many different reasons, but what should we have done? Like, like I, I just, this is what I struggle with because, you know, I, I can sit here and, and poke holes in the domino theory all day, but I don't have a, really a better answer because, you know what I mean? Uh, but, our, our Monday morning quarterback <laughs> 2020. Yes. And it's true. And, um, I don't, I don't believe in the utility or the purpose of counterfactual questions. Um, hmm. Answering the question of what we should have done, I think it's much more important to understand why what was done is done hmm. and what we can learn from it, because that is something that you can take home and put in the bank. Hmm. And, um, my, my hope is that when you read this book, you come away.
by grasping um, the dangers, limitations, dysfunctions, and vulnerabilities of high-level decision-making in Washington as it really is, as it always has been and probably always will be. I want present and future decision-makers to read this book because I think that those who tend to make it to the top of our system um, have a lot going for them, but a healthy dose of uh, self-awareness and self-limitation is usually not included. Um, and reading this book is a cautionary tale uh, which can uh, hopefully be helpful to them and to recognize that they too have their own Achilles heels. Mm-hmm. And, and they too, like the best of us, um, were smart, well-intentioned, and loved the country. You can love this country and damage it nonetheless. And that is a shocking reality. Mm. Um, or I, this is just a separate thing, but like, what is your opinion of Henry Kissinger? Because I have had a big problem with him for a long time, but you tell me what you think. I'm going to punt on that. I never researched the uh, same depth uh, decision making on Vietnam during the Nixon years. Yes. Kennedy and Johnson years. I've, I've only gotten my information from the most strident of sources, so I, <laughs> but I've absorbed it all. But I, I want to yeah, hear an objective third opinion somehow. <laughs> but it's okay if you don't want to answer. <laughs> if they comes when I decide to write about that uh, in the books in Kissinger years, uh, then I will do my homework. Okay. If we talk, then I will offer you more. Okay, great, great. I'm not ready to make any grand pronouncements myself, but I just, I have a lot of theories myself, but I, I'm not ready to say them out loud yet, but anyhow, um, yeah. So, um, do you think people have learned from Vietnam and the decisions that led to it, or have we? are we just walking into the same rake over and over again? I mean, it, it seems like we're talking about Afghanistan before, uh, you know, it seems like we're just doing it, but even worse, and I don't know, it's like, we have, what have we learned, what have we not learned, I guess? I, I think the honest answer is yes and no. I think that there are lessons that can be learned from failures. You can learn far more from your failures than you can from your successes. And I think that the analogies between Vietnam um, and um, Iraq and Afghanistan are real. Though, as Obama himself pointed out, uh, you never step into the same stream twice. There's mm-hmm. never an exact replication of the circumstances of that. But uh, if, if people at levels of government and military where they have responsibilities of this magnitude um, by reading this story come away with a greater appreciation and sober understanding of the uh, constraints cognitively uh, that afflict all of us uh, it's not going to guarantee that they won't make some mistakes but it will mitigate the likelihood that they will uh, the last time I checked human nature is imperfect and uh, you can never eliminate um, vulnerabilities and risks, but you can mitigate them um, to a very great degree. And I like to think that the lessons of Vietnam, if they are uh, absorbed and internalized, uh, will help decision makers today and tomorrow uh, mitigate their vulnerabilities. I'm certain they're just as smart, just as well intentioned, and just as patriotic as the best and the brightest who fail ethically on Vietnam. Um, now, now you uh, you're a teacher, so how do how are kids absorbing this history today? It's it's. I just think about when I was learning history; it was always my favorite subject, but it always seemed a little bit abstract. But I feel like some of the themes keep repeating themselves as they often do. But uh, I just feel like we we we're a little more. It's a little more visceral uh, this time in history. It it just feels like you know when I was in, it was when I was in the '90s and everything seemed idyllic. Uh, I could think about abstract things like even Vietnam seemed a long time ago. But now it's like, gosh, the same things keep happening again and again. We have the same uh, national nationalist movements across the world, for example, that's, that's something we have to worry about again. You know what I mean? So now it's not as much of an abstract. So how are kids that you're t- uh, dealing with absorbing this today? Well, I would say two things. Um, one is that that particular cohort of students uh, will all, uh, within a few years, become junior officers in the United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps. Mm. A significant number of them are going to be deployed to places where they will uh, be risking their life um, on our behalf. So the stakes for them when it comes to a decision like this are very real. And uh, I think they all understand that intimately. Hmm. Some of them will eventually be very senior military officers who have very great responsibility hmm. advising the secretaries of defense uh, about issues of war and peace. So I think that makes them um, very keen to understand the lessons that Vietnam offers. Uh, and I think, too, that the human costs of Vietnam 
um, were so tremendous, um, not just American lives, but the infinitely larger number of Indochini Chinese lives that were lost in the war. Mm-hmm. Um, it had the poignancy uh, and a reality uh, to that story, uh, which uh, I think helps make it extraordinarily compelling in a tragic way. Mm-hmm. Right. Definitely. Um, well, I mean, that's most of the things I had to ask you about. Was there anything I didn't ask you about the book? I mean, I, there's 500 pages, so obviously we didn't get to everything, but is there, is there anything we didn't talk about that, that you wanted to get to here? Well, Rob, I think you've asked very thoughtful questions, and uh, I appreciate that, and I'm sure your listeners appreciate that, too. So uh, thank you for putting those questions to me, and I hope that... Uh, my answers to them have been helpful for those who listen to your podcast. Oh, very good. Yeah, for sure. Now, I have to ask one question before we go. I ask this every time. What music have you been listening to lately? Well, um, I do have an affinity for classical music. Um, and uh, I like some of the, the uh, composers uh, like Bach um, and Chopin. So mm. It's sort of a, um, a contemplative, reflective sort of music, which I find very useful when I'm reading and thinking and trying to write. Oh, absolutely. Well, I just, I think the part of my brain, because when I'm writing a story or something, I just can't listen to a song with words. So I have been trying to listen to instrumental music more just because I think that I don't want to like crowd the part of my brain that's putting words together. It just, it seems like they, they fight each other when I'm trying to like listen because I'm, I'm a person, my wife listens to songs and she's like, she says she can't even hear the lyrics. Like it's just noise to her, but like, I'm like listening to every lyric, like thinking about it as I'm listening to it. So. I literally need music without words just to be able to make words happen. <laughs> so. I feel Mendelssohn called Songs Without Words, mm. uh, which you might enjoy listening to. Yeah. But, uh, the genre of music that works for you may be different than that which works for me and others, but that's the beauty of music. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, no, I have been trying to listen to more uh, classical lately. I feel like I keep stumbling on these like uh, Germans that are very like, dun, 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 like <laughs> or, I don't know. I like I put it on one of those like playlists on Spotify that's like classical favorites, and then I'm like listening to some like march from like uh, <laughs> somebody in Germany, and I'm like, okay, just back it up, <laughs> back up. Bach. <laughs> Go back to. Uh... Beethoven and even earlier to Mozart uh, and, and Bach. Uh, I think you'll find uh, what you're looking for. Cool. Well, great. Well, hey, it's been a fascinating conversation. I'm really enjoying your book. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for taking the time again. I really do appreciate it. My pleasure, Rob.
If you enjoy this podcast, there are several ways to support it. Join the Rob Burgess Show mailing list. Go to tinyletter.com forward slash the Rob Burgess Show and type in your email address. Then respond to the automatic message. I have a Patreon account, which can be found at patreon.com forward slash Rob Burgess Show Patreon. I hope you'll consider supporting in any amount. Also, please make sure to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available, including iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, Internet Archive, TuneIn, and RSS. The official website for the podcast is www.therobburgessshow.com. You can find out more about me by visiting my website, www.thisburgess.com. And if you have something to say, record a voice memo on your smartphone and send it to therobburgessshow at gmail.com. Include voice memo in the subject line of the email. Until next time.